Good. Looking at the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 27, and we'll be reading verses 11 to 26. Matthew 27, starting at verse 11 to 26. Matthew 27, starting at verse 11. Now Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor asked him, saying, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus said to him, It is as you say. And while he was being accused by the chief priests and elders, he answered nothing. Then Pilate said to him, Do you not hear how many things they testify against you? But he answered him not one word, so that the governor marveled greatly. Now at the feast, the governor was accustomed to releasing to the multitude one prisoner whom they wished. And at that time, they had a notorious prisoner called Barabbas. Therefore, when they had gathered together, Pilate said to them, Whom do you want me to release to you, Barabbas or Jesus, who is called Christ? For he knew that they had handed him over because of envy. While he was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife sent to him, saying, Have nothing to do with that just man. For I have suffered many things today in a dream because of him. But the chief priests and the elders persuaded the multitudes that they should ask for Barabbas and destroy Jesus. The governor answered and said to them, Which of the two do you want me to release to you? They said, Barabbas. Pilate said to them, What then shall I do with Jesus who is called Christ? They all said to him, Let him be crucified. Then the governor said, Why? What evil has he done? But they cried out all the more, saying, Let him be crucified. When Pilate saw that he could not prevail at all, but rather that a tumult was rising, he took water and washed his hands before the multitude, saying, I am innocent of the blood of this just person. You see to it. And all the people answered and said, His blood be on us and on, and on our children. Then he released Barabbas to them. And when he had scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. Our song of preparation is number 350, How When I Survey the Wondrous Cross. And let's rise to sing the four stanzas of number 350. Please also turn with me in the back of the Blue Psalter hymnal to page 22. 
page 22, as we look this afternoon at the Heidelberg Catechism, Lord's Day 15. And again, we're still in, the, in a dissection of the Apostles' Creed, and uh, we're looking this afternoon at the um, confession that uh, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified. Lord's Day 15 on page 22. Let's read through questions and answers 37 to 39. What do you understand by the word suffered? We answer that during his whole life on earth, but especially at the end, Christ sustained in body and soul the anger of God against the sin of the whole human race. This he did in order that, by his suffering, as the only atoning sacrifice, he might set us free body and soul, from eternal condemnation and gain for us God's grace, righteousness, and eternal life. Question and answer 38, why did he suffer under Pontius Pilate as judge? We answer so that he, though innocent, might be condemned by a civil judge and so free us from the severe judgment of God that was to fall on us. Question and answer 39, is it significant that he was crucified instead of dying some other way? We answer yes. This death convinces me that he shouldered the curse which lay on me since death by crucifixion was accursed by God. Beloved congregation of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ, we've spent a number of weeks exploring the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. We've looked at his name, his title, his sonship, his miraculous conception and birth we saw last time. And it's very important that we, we understand these things because we cannot divorce the person of Jesus from his work. So, for instance, if we were to merely speak of Jesus dying on the cross for us uh, without really knowing and understanding who Jesus is, we would really be emptying our salvation of, of the great and deep significance that it holds. But we realize that the one who died for us was no one less than the eternal Son of God. He was the second person of the triune Godhead. He is the divine and exalted Lord and creator of the universe. We understand and are reminded again that God himself, the divine Son of God, suffered and died on the cross for us. That's why his suffering and death is so unique and so amazing. But this is what we needed. Only one who was divine and at the same time truly righteous man could save us. We needed one who could suffer the torments of hell for us, who could bear upon himself the eternal anger of God against our sins and so free us from our sins. And Jesus came to fulfill these requirements for us and to take upon himself the suffering that was needed to reconcile us to this holy God. Our theme then, as we look at Lord's Day 15 this afternoon, is this. The church confesses the divinely required suffering of the Son of God. The church confesses the divinely required suffering of the Son of God. And we'll see that Christ suffered in the first place to appease divine justice, and in the second place to fulfill divine judgment. But we see in the first place that the suffering of our Savior was meant to appease divine justice. And boys and girls, once again, to appease means to quiet or to pacify, to calm, to calm uh, down. Uh, so Jesus' suffering was to calm down, to pacify, to quiet, to appease the divine justice of God. Now, many Christians we know have suffered greatly throughout history. Many have died suffering excruciating pain unjustly, and they have died out of malice and spite at the hands of their enemies. Many have been children of God who glorified him by giving their lives. In the Old Testament, just a few examples, we read of the priests of Nob who were slaughtered by King Saul. We read of the prophets killed off by Jezebel in the time of Ahab. We read of the stoning of the priest Zechariah during the reign of King Joash. And still today, we have martyrs that give their lives for the cause of Christ. Uh, Christians who are beheaded, burned alive, there are uh, those who are bombed to death in their churches, those who are placed into prison and tortured for the sake of Christ in places like Syria and Afghanistan and North Korea, China, India, and many places. And so many Christians throughout history and still today have suffered greatly and continue to suffer, but none of these, and this is not to make light of their suffering, but none of these measure up to the suffering of Jesus because His suffering 
was not only suffering for a time, but a lifetime of suffering. In answer, or question and answer 37, we uh, confess that we understand by the word suffer that during his whole life on earth, but especially at the end, Christ sustained in body and soul the anger of God against the sin of the hu a whole human race. And so none who came before Jesus could claim that at every moment, every second of their lives was full of suffering. None could claim that their entire lifetime was accompanied by suffering and pain. And yet this is what the life of Jesus, our Savior, was. This is what was involved in Him being the one who would redeem us from our bondage to sin. He who was perfect in every way took on the imperfections of His creatures. He who was self-existent and independent took on the, the, the needy uh, human nature. Christ took on all the weaknesses and infirmities of the human nature except for sin, of course. To be our perfect Savior, He had to stand under the just anger of God against the sin of the whole human race. And He was able to do this only by His first taking on our flesh and our, sinful, uh, and our human nature with all its weaknesses. And you see, the sufferings that we face as human beings are the result of the fall. Sin has placed us under God's wrath. The ground was cursed. Death, sickness, tiredness, weakness, all of these things entered into our existence. Hunger and thirst took on the nature of something we're always striving to satisfy. And Jesus Christ, the Son of God, speared Himself none of these weaknesses when He came into the world. He was surely conceived by the Holy Spirit, and so he had, on the one hand, a, a divine nature, but he was, as we saw, born of the Virgin Mary, and so he had a fully human nature. He took on a human nature that was subject to all the physical consequences of sin all his life, and he took on a human nature that was subject to mental and emotional suffering as well. And so Jesus experienced the full effects of temptation, for instance, while never actually succumbing to it at any time. He was afflicted with deep anguish of soul at the suffering of his people. Many times he was exceedingly tired, yet he continued to heal the sick that came to him. He grieved over the sinful tendencies of those to whom he ministered. His compassionate heart was moved as he surveyed his people who were, he said, like sheep without a shepherd. He was angered by the carelessness of the religious leaders, the false shepherds. All through his life, Christ suffered the torment of soul as he surveyed the effects sin had brought upon man. And so we find him weeping at the tomb of Lazarus. He watched men walk away from eternal life because the riches and the comforts of this world were more attractive. He lived with the daily reality that he had come to his own, but his own would not receive him. That light had come into the world, but men loved the darkness because their deeds were evil. And let us not forget that all through his life, Jesus lived under the shadow of the cross. He lived his life understanding that he had come to do his father's business. While others around him perhaps heard the scriptures read without really grasping the significance of what they were saying, Jesus, all through his life, understood exactly what the scriptures were saying. When the Psalms were sung, especially the ones, uh, the ones that spoke of the suffering of the Messiah, think of Psalm 22, the words had to pierce the heart of Jesus at what lay ahead for him. And then at the end of his life, there was the betrayal of one of his closest friends and companions. His companions fled at his arrest. One who swore that he would always stand by him no matter what, denied that he even knew him. Jesus, the judge of all the earth, found himself under the judgment of vengeful judges. And then there was the final rejection by his people. We read in Matthew 27, verses 20 to 23, but the chief priests and elders persuaded the multitudes that they should ask for Barabbas and destroy Jesus. The governor answered and said to them, Which of the two do you want me to release to you? They said, Barabbas. Pilate said to them, What then shall I do with Jesus, who is called Christ? They all said to him, Let him be crucified. Then the governor said, Why, what evil has he done? But they cried out all the more, saying, Let him be crucified. 
And here were gathered those among whom he had walked through his three years of ministry. Here were those who had seen his miracles, his healings, his mercy and his compassion. Here were those who were experts in the scriptures that spoke of him. And what was their cry? Crucify him. End his life. Erase him from the face of the earth. What was the reward reaped by a Savior who endured a lifetime of suffering and torment? The mockery, the curses, the murderous hatred of those he came to save. And yet, that is what was required of him. Only in this way could he free us, body and soul, from eternal condemnation and gain for us God's grace righteousness and eternal life jesus christ the son of god needed to walk this road he could not shrink back one step the suffering of a true and perfect savior involved a lifetime of suffering but it also included standing under an unjust judge in question and answer 38 we're asked why did he suffer under pontius pilate as judge we answer so that he though innocent might be condemned by a civil judge and so free us from the severe judgment of god that was to fall on us now one of the questions that people often ask uh, concerning the apostles creed is why is the name pontius pilate inc included in our confession and, the, and people think well should not this vile uh, figure of history be blotted out and never mentioned again. Isn't it a little shameful to even mention his name in one of the most important creeds of the Christian religion? Why give to Pontius Pilate the honor of taking his name upon our lips every time we confess what we believe? But congregation, we have to understand that Pontius Pilate is given no honor in the Apostles' Creed. He's mentioned because it was vital that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, be tried and condemned under him. He was part of God's program in the suffering of Christ. And so it's not so much about Pontius Pilate, but about what Jesus suffered at his hands. The, his position, his character, and responsibility were all incorporated into God's plan of salvation. And so, for instance, we hear Peter saying in the book of Acts, chapter uh, 2, verse 23, in Acts 2, verse 23, Peter says to the crowds on the day of Pentecost, speaking of Jesus, him being delivered by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God, you have taken by lawless hands, have crucified and put to death. And so Pontius Pilate's participation in the death of Christ was, according to Peter in, uh, in Acts chapter 2, it was according to God's set purpose and foreknowledge. God foreordained that this figure in history would be the judge before whom his, his son would stand. In John 19, verse 11, Jesus says to Pilate, you could have no power over me unless it had been given to you from above. And so Pilate's power over Jesus was not his own. It was delegated to him by God the Father. God the Father placed his son under the authority of this earthly judge at this time to fulfill his purposes. Now Pontius Pilate was what was called the procurator of the district of Judea and Samaria at that time. And a procurator was an official appointed by Rome to govern or to oversee a certain area. And their responsibilities included tax and financial matters and maintaining order. The Romans were all about order. And these procurators or governors, they had the authority to proclaim and carry out the sentence of death upon anyone who disturbed the peace and order which Rome treasured above all else. And now Pontius Pilate was the ruling, governing authority in that region at that time, and so it is before him that the spotless Lamb of God stood. Though innocent, Jesus needed to be condemned by a civil judge. We say, why? So that an earthly authority might proclaim the innocence of Jesus even while he was condemning him to death. Or in other words, our salvation required that the Christ receive the testimony of the very judge who condemned him to death. Luke records in his account in uh, Luke uh, 23, verses 13 to 15, then Pilate, when he had called together the chief priests, the rulers and the people, said to them, you have brought this man to me as one who misleads the people. 
And indeed, having examined him in your presence, I have found no fault in this man concerning those things of which you accuse him. No, neither did Herod, for I sent you back to him. And indeed, nothing deserving of death has been done by him. And so Pilate, it's very clear in the Bible, Pilate found no grounds for the death penalty in his dealings with Christ. He was amazed that Jesus made no attempts to defend himself against the accusation of the Jews, as we heard in verse 12 when we read Matthew 27. He, in fact, was ready to release Jesus, as was his custom, as we read, to release a prisoner at the time of the feast. His wife even warned him, calling Jesus a just man or an innocent man. In response to the cries of the Jews for the death, uh, de for the death of Jesus, he asked, why? What crime has he committed? And in a last-ditch effort to excuse himself, he washed his hands in front of them, saying, I am innocent of this man's blood. You do it yourself. He protested the innocence of Jesus to the end, but the crowd would not hear it. Crucify him, crucify him, was their cry, and they shouted it all the more. And so the Son of God, in whom there was no deceit, who had clean hands and a pure heart, who defied the religious leaders of his day to find in him any guilt of sin. He who was tempted in every way as we are, yet was without sin. The Son of God was condemned to die. In congregation, God in his providence left no stone unturned. No cause for dispute was left. No question remained hanging. Jesus Christ died on the Roman cross, not for his own sin, not for any wrongdoing on his part, but for ours. He was acquitted of any crime by a civil judge, yet he was handed over to be crucified. But this is what the suffering of the Savior required, a lifetime of suffering and to stand before and be condemned by an unjust judge at the end of his life. But we also see in the second place that the suffering of our Savior was meant to fulfill divine judgment. In question and answer 39, we're asked, is it significant that he was crucified instead of dying some other way? We answer, yes. This death convinces me that he shouldered the curse which lay on me since death by crucifixion was accursed by God. The Jews thought they had it covered. Hand him over to the Romans, have him executed for treason. Of course, they hated the Romans with every facet of their being. But if they could use this vicious practice, this disgusting practice of the Romans to crucify this Jesus and get rid of this so-called Christ and to teach, him a deadly, uh, teach a deadly lesson, then why not? It would teach him and others who challenge their authority that you do not mess with the Sanhedrin and get away with it. And so they handed Jesus over to the Romans and they demanded that he be crucified. Now, cru now crucifixion was not something that was invented by the Romans but they certainly perfected it. But because it was such a disgusting practice, they reserved it only for slaves, for assassins, for thieves, and for traitors. Almost never was a Roman citizen crucified. So disgusting was the practice. Now apparently, once the order was given to, that this person was going to be crucified, death by, uh, by crucifixion, the prisoner would be flogged with a leather whip which was loaded with metal or bone. And that beating was so violent and took such a toll on the human body that it was actually nicknamed the first death. The prisoner was then made, after that beating, he was made to carry the heavy cross piece to the place of his execution where he would then be stripped of his clothes and he would be nailed to the crossbar. And the crossbar was then attached to an upright post and the prisoner was left to hang. And sometimes it would die by suffocation. Sometimes death was very slow taking up to two to three days sometimes, and very, very painful. And sometimes the only relief came when the soldiers would come along if they wanted to hasten this death, as in the case of Jesus, and they would break the legs of the crucified prisoner, causing the body to go into shock and hasten death. And so it was quite horrific, quite gruesome to even think about. And even if we could come to terms with the fact, okay, well, Jesus as our Savior had to die for us. Sometimes we might even wonder, well, why did it have to be this way? Why such a gruesome, ugly, painful, horrific death? But congregation, 
Be assured that this too was within God's sovereign plan. Crucifixion, which was equivalent to being hung on a tree that is suspended between heaven and earth. Crucifixion was an accursed death in the sight of God. A couple of passages that uh, remind us of this. Deuteronomy 21, verses 22 to 23 Deuteronomy 21, 22 to 23, God says to Israel through Moses, if a man has committed a sin deserving of death and he is put to death and you hang him on a tree, his body shall not remain overnight on the tree, but you shall surely bury him that day so that you do not defile the land which the Lord your God is giving you as an inheritance, for he who is hanged is accursed of God. And so the cross was not only a tree of pain, it was a tree of shame. It was a death that represented condemnation and being under God's curse. It represented divine judgment. And now listen to Galatians 3, verses 13 to 14. Paul writes, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us, for it is written, quoting Deuteronomy, Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree, that the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles in Christ Jesus, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. And so the cross represented God's judgment. It represented God's forsaking of his own dear son, the excommunication of the Lord Jesus Christ from God's favor and blessing. The cross symbolizes that Jesus bore the curse that was upon us. He died the death that embodied the just wrath and judgment of a holy God for us. And only in this way could he earn the promise that was given to Abraham for us. In congregation, what we've examined this afternoon is the divinely required suffering of the Son of God. We've seen that the suffering of one who would free us from our sin is unique in that his agony must be lifelong. It includes standing under an unjust judge and it includes dying an accursed death. And only one has met these requirements and his name is Jesus Christ the eternal and only begotten Son of God. And so all that is left to ask is this. Do you believe in this Savior? Are you reconciled to God through Him? And we have to remember that if God did not spear His Son this suffering, it's impossible to imagine that He will spear any who then in turn reject His Son. The author of Hebrews in chapter 10 verse 29 writes, of how much worse punishment do you suppose will he be thought worthy who has trampled the Son of God underfoot, counted the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified a common thing and insulted the Spirit of grace? How much indeed? It's too horrific to imagine. And so let us believe in Jesus. Let us rejoice in such a Savior in whom alone is there grace, righteousness, and eternal life. And let us in turn take up our cross and deny ourselves and be willing to suffer for him who suffered so greatly for us. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for the salvation that you have brought about in your son Jesus Christ. Thank you that you allowed your son to suffer so greatly that you gave him indeed into the hands of those who treated him unjustly so that he died a most vicious, heinous, horrific death to appease divine justice, to fulfill divine judgment, to free us sinners, unworthy as we are from our sins. Thank you for him who, who, who died to make us right with you. Help us to believe in Him. Help us to trust in Him and in the times when we look at ourselves and we see our failings and our shortcomings, help us to once again look to the Lord Jesus Christ to the perfection of His salvation and to know that our sins are forgiven. Our debt has been made clean. Our ransom has been paid. And no more will you hold our sins against, it, against those who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. We pray this in His name alone. Amen.
Number 352 is our song of response. Alas, and did my Savior bleed, and did my Sovereign die. Let's rise to sing the four stanzas of 352. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, bless us as we continue to worship you now by the giving of our offerings. Thank you for the opportunity to 